Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it's already started a, a problem uh, in the streaming, but like life is live. This is very important, and we all four believe in us, Angelina Georgieva, Mi Stefan Štereb, Vili Prager, and Tiva Sveštarova, that life should stay where it's supposed to be. Life, we know that it's strange now that we are separated, that we keep distance. We are with masks, but that's the situation for now. Welcome, everybody, on Choreographic Convention 5, here at the Goethe Institute, Sofia. Uh, this event will happen in the cer certain circumstances, and will be here, as you see, on the tables behind, as well as on Zoom, and we are broadcasting it live now uh, on our page on Facebook. So that's very technical. The coffee is outside. For those who are watching you now, it's in your home, in your kitchen. You can have it. Angelina Georgieva. Uh, hello also from me. Yes, indeed, this uh, convention will happen in a mixed format. But of course, the question is uh, a convention of movement on movement research now. Why? In a recent publication titled, namely, Movement Research, dance artist and theoretician Morten Spomberg writes, Why movement research now? Well, obviously, movement research all the time and especially today. Though the term is linked to some specific moments in dance history, it hasn't lost its currency today. Movement research is a part of the uh, curriculum of dance schools, Consciously or not, it happens within the creative process and performance practice of dancers and choreographers. But still, it remains not entirely clear what it signifies and what kind of activities it is related to. For some artists, it sounds actually like a promise. For some artists, it is a promise to constantly rearticulate the relationship between the dancer and the dance as dance artist Ali Shusho wrote some time ago. For others, it is a promise to reinvent the past in the present. For digital artists who work in the field of, chore of choreography and performance, movement is data which can be used in a way that amplifies and makes tangible aspects of the body's corporeality which cannot be known otherwise, as Marco Donnarumma said in one interview some time ago. The proposal of this convention is to have a closer look on what is the relevance of movement research to the dance field today. But we want to see also what perspectives body-based practices can offer on the ways we examine social movements and forms of political resistance in public spaces today. So the convention was conceived before the pandemic and I would like to thank all the panelists for staying with us in this. It has been really very dynamic and unpredictable time and it's really still a challenge. Thanks to all the people here in the, in the room and also online. The aim of this convention is to create discussion on the topics and the statements expressed in the panels. And uh, we really hope for your involvement. For our online viewers on the Facebook page of Antistatic, you can write your questions or comments under the video stream and we will hand them on to the moderators. So let's wish us two inspiring days. Thank you. And of course, what is one choreographic convention without live performances? This night and tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in DNK, Space for Contemporary Dance and Performance, the people which are in Sofia can see tonight at 7 o'clock Kuberg Variation by Yuri Konyar. And tomorrow, Drag on Akaponi by Steam Room, uh, Jana Penchev, uh, Bulgaria, Dario uh, Barreto from Spain, and Alexander Georgiev from uh, North Macedonia. You are very welcome to join the live performances because life is life. Uh, good morning for me too. So, a choreographic convention is a program initiated by the European project Lifelong Burning towards a sustainable ecosystem for contemporary dance in Europe. 
Uh, this program and this project is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of European Union. And uh, Horographic Convention is designed as a platform for addressing current issues of the field of dance. And now in Sofia, it's already the fifth edition uh, organized within the frame of anti-static festival. And choreographic convention here in Sofia is supported by the culture program of Sofia Municipality, Ministry of Culture of Bulgaria, and in partnership with DENCA, Space for Contemporary Dance and Performers, and Giotti Institute Bulgaria, our host for these two days. And now I would like to welcome Marina Ludeman, the director of Giotti Institute. Thank you, Eva. Dobre Dushli, welcome in the Goethe Institute. We are, we are um, very happy to host the fifth choreographic convention and we want to thank the organizers, Eva Sveshtarova, Willy Prager, Stefan Sterev, and Angelina Georgieva for putting together such a great program under these difficult conditions. I also want to thank all of you, especially our guests from abroad, who, that you did come in spite of all the obstacles and those who participate online. Researching movement is probably even more important since due to the pandemic, we spend most of our times isolated and stuck in front of the monitors. The motto of this year's anti-static festival, life is life, couldn't be more appropriate and important. Um, and the topics you will discuss the next two days, like the social political significance of movement uh, and the influence of new technologies, etc., are crucial, not only for the artistic scene and academics, but for society in general. Therefore, I want to congratulate uh, to the fifth choreographic convention and to the 13th anti-static festival. And I am proud that the Goethe Institute has been a partner since the beginning. And I can assure you that we will continue to support your work. I wish you a very successful and joyful conference and um, hope to um, be able to participate a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Yes, and now, just a second. Yep, I would like to introduce Alexandra Kolb. It is uh, really a pleasure to have her kicking the beginning of the choreographic convention with her keynote address beyond the dance, the politics, and philosophy of movement research. Alexandra Cope is professor of dance at the University of Ruhanton. She has previously reader, senior lecturer, and chair of dance program at different universities. She is the author of the performing femininity, dance, and literature in German modernism and she is a research degree convener and wrote Hattam and review editors for dance research. So, <laughs> Alexandra, are you there? Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Wow. Yes, I can hear you. Alexandra, thank you. Really, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And for you, now you have Alexandra with you. <laughs> thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Eva, uh, and, and I'm very pleased to be to be there in spirit, even if uh, not physically, uh, given the circumstances. But uh, welcome, everyone, and, and hello from France. I'm currently in France uh, on a visiting professorship rather than in London, where I usually reside. So, um, beyond dance, the politics and philosophy of movement research, and I believe, Eva, uh, you have my PowerPoint presentation of one of your, uh, one of your colleagues. So if we could show the, the first the first slide. I mean the, the just the beginning maybe. 
There you go. Brilliant. Thank you. Beyond dance, the politics and philosophy of movement research. What is dance? This was American choreographer Merce Cunningham's answer. Dancing for me, he said, is movement in time and space. Its possibilities are bound only by our imaginations and our two legs. He said this in the event for television. After modern dance's emphasis on the expression of emotions and the ballet boom of the immediate post-war era, the 1960s period was one of dramatic change in dance aesthetics opening up the art form to a more inclusive interpretation, which explored dance's fundamental elements of movement and the body. Most cunning and most pathfinding, starting from the 1950s uh, in questioning and collapsing certain conventions of dance. For instance, by including chance operations, which effectively diminished the authorial status of the choreographer drawing on innovations in music by his partner, John Cage. By using non-representational non choreography that simply emphasized movement, by extending uh, movement vocabulary through his computer software life forms, and if we could show the first slide, so the next slide, uh, which shows a life form on uh, com computer uh, animation, and by valuing process over product. Similarly, the Japanese form of Hu Tao and a decade or so later German artist Pina Bausch also departed from traditional parameters. Hu Tao did this among others by capturing performers in fetal and other primal positions before acculturation and socialization had made an imprint on their bodies. And while Bausch's dance theater drew on the rich legacy of German modern dance, as, as actually did uh, Hu Tao, uh, she disrupted traditional dramaturgic structures through her collage technique, undermining conventional staging formats, costume conventions, and to some extent the ideal body paradigm, for instance when deploying elderly people in the 2000 uh, version of Contactful. So I've got a photo of this on the next slide, if you don't, yeah, there you go, so Contactful with ladies and gentlemen over 65. My focus today will be the innovations uh, of these artists, but notably the American postmodernists centered on uh, Judson Dance Theater and the stimuli they provided for later generations of choreographers. The design of my address will be twofold. It will, on one hand, inquire into the philosophical foundations of these developments, many of which were initiated in neighboring art forms, notably the visual arts. We can go to the next slide, please. So Marcel Duchamp's famous urinal turned upside down, titled Fountain, had as early as 1917 challenged what we understand by art and how art should be classified and defined, a provocative stance that was soon to be emulated in dance. By a similar token, I will argue that these innovations reflected political trends responding and to some extent contributing to the 1960s civil rights and other democratizing movements, and that they can be seen to reflect political systems or ideologies. Lastly, I will suggest how these 20th century artists' approaches and socio-political value sets left a lasting legacy for subsequent choreographers through their explorations beyond dance. And of course, we're going to hear more uh, about these innovations today uh, in the later panels and tomorrow. And I very much look forward to, uh, to hearing more uh, about these. So, philosophy. The aesthetic changes brought about in the era going by the term postmodernism, which in dance is typically seen to comprise the 1960s and 70s, is probably best understood with recourse to what went beforehand. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy concerned with art, and especially beauty, following the German Baumgarten's definition of beauty as perfection perceived by sensory means, thus in contrast with the intellect or rational knowledge. This was also how dance was often, how dance was often perceived, as dance critic Théophile Gautier wrote in 1837, and this is on the next slide. Thank you. After all, he writes, 
dancing has no other purpose but to display beautiful bodies and graceful poses and develop lines that are pleasing to the eye. Pre-20th century art was to be appreciated through contemplation, as Immanuel Kant put it. And later philosophers construe of dance as an expressive form, perhaps as summarized by Suzanne Lange, uh, according to whom uh, dance is, I quote, expressive of human feeling, is most aptly applied to modern dance. In the 21st century, the association of art and beauty lives on. For instance, in conservative philosopher Roger Scruton's association of high art um, with life of the mind, which he claims is, quote, concerned with the true, the beautiful, and the good. However, such traditional aesthetics fall short of capturing much of the 1960s developments, notably Judson and artists working in their environs, such as Twyla's Farb, and they certainly fail to encapsulate the zeitgeist of contemporary dance. Postmodern dance questioned many traditional parameters within which dance operated. It not only eschewed uh, technical virtuosity, such as 32 40 on point, or high complex jumps, such as Batu. But in fact, the very definition of dance was at stake. If by dance we understand a recognizable movement vocabulary, accompanied by music, rhythmicity, or entertainment value, for instance. In other words, dance no longer relied on the presence of perceptible intrinsic features or markers. Let's cite Lucinda Child's street dance as a case in point. And this is on the next slide. Uh, not the dance itself, you see on the left-hand side, uh, just an excerpt of the street on which it was performed. Uh, we don't, I, I don't think we have any photographs uh, of this. It featured two performers pointing out architectural details in a Manhattan street, while the audience watched from a window above. The dancers weren't even recognizable by passers-by as performers, so much did their movements blend in with their everyday environment. Or consider Steve Paxton's A Satisfying Lover from 1967, in which amateur performers, following a simple score, simply walked from right to left stage and occasionally sat down. And we can maybe uh, have a quick look at an excerpt, maybe one or two minutes of, of it, for, for those of you who are not acquainted with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the work. Thank you. So this is Satisfying Lover by Steve Paxton. Thank you very much. If they go back to the PowerPoint. Now, we, these two are, are very different works, but the literally pedestrian activity they entail challenged the idea that dance is defined by anything internal to it at all, redirecting the question of what counts as dance. Other choreographers have collapsed theatrical and real time in so-called task dances, many of which focused unceremoniously on basic movements or beat occasionally in unusual locations. If we show on the next slide, um, Trisha Brown's man walking down the side of the building is, is probably the most famous. But there were a, a range of other task dances, including people just brushing their teeth. And this, the dance started when they began to brush their teeth and it ended when they were finished. Other dancers, again, emphasized the minuteness of movement, renouncing the idea of spectacle 
and instead observing and emulating ordinary movements in nature. Paxton, for instance, so Steve Paxton, was influenced by English photographer Edward Muybridge, who did pioneering work in photographic uh, studies of motion. And this is on the next slide. Thank you. His photography allowed us for the first time to penetrate even the most ordinary movements and fractions of seconds. And Paxton once wrote to me that he was intrigued by, and I quote from the interview uh, that I conducted with him at the time, his stop action exploration of the movements of humans and animals, and also in those examples, the idea of photo scores as tools for choreography. Some of you will be acquainted with minor dance, but Paxton's smiling is less known. He described it to me thus, the two performers do not move much. There's one chair upon which either may sit. They smile for five minutes. They may not look at the audience. That's it. Such movement as occurs is postural adjustment, change of gaze, sitting or standing. How do we distinguish, we might wonder, between these artwork status as dance and my mother walking to the post office or just smiling at me intently? Such works subvert the distinction between art as a specialized and higher type of human activity and the everyday as the lived, commonplace and non-distinct realities of ordinary human beings. Accordingly, philosophers had to find new theories to incorporate such work which, for instance, refers to its intentionality, its context, and institutional framework, among others. It also raises intriguing questions about the complex distinction between dance and choreography, which I cannot fully address yet, but would be an interesting point for discussion later on. Can we replace the term dance with choreography and thus avoid the question of how to pin it down? Now, secondly, I'm going to, to address politics and the political dimension of, uh, of this work. So, um, some works such as Paxton's anti-Vietnam War piece, Collaboration with Winter Soldier, performed in 1971 at the Whitney Museum in New York, were explicit in their political message. By and large, however, they were not, or at least not so obviously so. As Yvonne Ra uh, Rayner writes, and I quote, just as ideological issues have no bearing on the nature of the work, neither does the tenor of current political and social conditions have any bearing on its uh, execution. Steve Paxton concurs with Rayner, claiming that many dance scholars unjustifiably impose political meanings on choreographies, which in fact had no political intent. And he said this to me in another interview that I conducted with him some 14 years ago. Yet there is reason to disagree with this view, and I shall explain why. As I argue in my book Dance and Politics, genres, creative processes, and even performer audience relationships can all have political connotations. Let's take Rayner's continued project Alter Daily. And you see here the program note of the, uh, of, of the performance on the left-hand side uh, and the scene on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the, by the way, was also inspired by, by a visual artist, namely Robert Morris, and in which the performers handled pillows and mattresses. It was created by a collective, the Grand Union, and is, in essence, an experiment in easing directorial authority by allowing performers' expressions to impact the choreographers, that is Rayner's, creative choices, making the piece genuinely multi-authored and providing a collective form of experience. Rayner explicitly claimed that there was a, quote, moral imperative to form a democratic structure, hence aligning it with a political ideology. Open devising processes like these were very much in keeping with the tenets of American counterculture of the 1960s, as the new left rejected the bureaucratic power of state institutions and demanded participatory instead of merely representative democracy. 
Similar observations apply to the use of space, notably the distributions, distribution of bodies in space, something we may not immediately recognize as a socio-political choice. Cunningham's works provide the best examples here. As opposed to traditional ballets or modern dance, they have no central point. Each dancer is his or her own center, and the action can take place at any point in the space or in two or more places simultaneously. And if we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. And he says, the idea of a single po a focus to which all adhere is no longer relevant. With the paintings of Jackson Pollock, and I thought it would be helpful to, 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 to uh, paste in a, a Jackson Pollock drip painting to give you an idea of what this looks uh, like in, in a museum. With the, with the paintings of Jackson Pollock, the eye can go any place on the canvas. No one point is more important than another. The de-emphasis of the center in both Pollock and Cunningham mean all space is considered equal, shifting attention not only to how performers move, but where they move. Likewise, Rayner's continuous project altered daily project, uh, 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 her continuous project altered daily, encouraged the audience to move between different performance areas during the work. And audience bodies, too, need to be considered as part of movement research, I would argue, thus intentionally undermining the notion of the passive spectator. A range of theatre makers, including uh, Antonin Artaud, and writers have drawn analogies between the passive electorate in existing democracies and the passive spectatorship in traditional proscenium theatres. And if you could have the next, sli next slide, please. So Norman Brown wrote uh, in Last Body in 1966, the detached observer who participates without action is the, sp the passive spectator. The division of citizens into politically active and passive is the major premise of modern political party organization. Lastly, we have already noted that Satisfying Lover and other works paved the way for the inclusion of differently shaped and sized bodies, including older and amateur performers. This reflects the acceleration of budding groups, such as the disability movement and progressive social attitudes towards aging, which aim at furthering inclusion and increasing the visibility of non-normative dancing bodies. A more inclusive practice was made possible in turn because a different materiality of the body and its ordinary movement material was seen to matter rather than its technicality and youth. So materiality of the body and ordinary movement, mater movement material over technicality and youth. Similar observations apply to contact improvisation and indeed other kinds of improvisation. Again, Uh, Paxton's Magnesium from 1972 paved the way. And maybe we can just have a quick uh, uh, look at, a, a, watch a, a brief excerpt of this. Uh, that would be great. Magnesium from 1972. Loops and dives from high points on other bodies. The act of falling has come to include an ability to adapt to the variables of distance, position and direction, and to intuit which part of my body will take the first moment of impact. The first part that touches the ground, I can use as a lever. By extending to that part, I can unify limbs and torso to prepare a sequence which will smoothly transmit my weight and accumulated momentum into the floor. Within the brief freedom of the fall, my... Thank you. So you already heard some of the commentary there in the background. Um, so contact uh, improv, as people often call it, consisted of giving and sharing weight between participants and so-called jams, not non-preconceived movement, which 
explored a relationship to another body. Falling, balance, placement, energy, and learning the body's mechanics. Tellingly, magnesium was also performed in a sports gymnasium rather than on stage or in a dance studio and resembles wrestling or other sports more than traditional dance. All these innovations, whilst exploding traditional aesthetic parameters, point to a democratization of dance and institutional structures and a move towards greater equality. Collapsing hierarchies in terms of which bodies are worth looking at, what type of movement counts as dance, and lastly, the authorial control over performers and audiences alike. Now, thirdly and finally, we look at the legacy and contemporary dance, and I'm sure we hear a lot more about this later on. The 1960s and 70s developments had a long-lasting impact on subsequent dance work, and what we term contemporary dance, itself a hard-to-define term, takes many inspirations from this era. One legacy is the sheer diversity and range of works, a, diver a diversity only made possible through the inclusion of non-conventional, everyday and non-technique-based movements in the first place. Conceptual dance, for instance, associated mainly with European choreographers such as Jérôme Bell, Javier Leroy, uh, or Leroy and uh, Jonathan Burroughs, shares uh, many features in common with postmodern dance. And I can refer you here to my colleague Anna Paik's article, which highlights their characteristics. And her article is mentioned at, at the end. Uh, you'll see this at the end in, in the uh, bibliography. So the characteristics are self-reflexivity, abandonment of conventional dance virtuosity, and choreographic structures, among others. Quite often, in today's work, the professionally trained bodies of the Judson era have been replaced by actual amateur bodies, and sometimes choreographers no longer have a dance background at all, and therefore use movement in a much broader sense. Many choreographers have rediscovered the museum as an apt work or performance space. Collectives and choreographic residencies are commonplace nowadays, and the ethos of many radical, so so-called radical collaborative working methods embrace the negotiation of individual differences rather than seeking consensus and unity. Such collaborations reflect a radical notion of democracy so see, for instance, Mouffe and Laclos uh, account, which accepts conflicts and tensions in its makeup and is grounded in flexible power structures. And models, of course, can be found in American postmodernism's group decision-making processes, such as in Rayner's Continuous Project. In these instances, movement research, as an experimental artistic practice, is part and parcel of the search for new models of socio-political togetherness. American choreographer William Forsyth, whose professional career started in ballet, provides further interesting examples. His and Dana Kasperson's installation work, White Bouncy Castle, and we see this on the next slide, thank you, from 1997, simply consists of a 40 meter long inflatable castle akin to those found in fun fairs where participants are invited to bounce around for a while after paying an admission fee. In movement and setup, it draws on everyday contexts, and the piece's conception leads quite literally to the collapse of the performer-audience dichotomy, as well as the counteracting authority of the choreographer. Secondly, with the so-called choreographic objects, Forsyth seeks to resist, as he calls it, resist and reform previous definitions of choreography, understood most broadly as movement activation, unmediated and sensual. And here's the fo uh, photograph of myself and one in Frankfurt. So that's the next slide. So yeah, it wasn't very easy, I, I can tell you, to maneuver uh, and uh, navigate uh, these, these rings, actually quite difficult. And the experience of instability in decentering uh, when on these rings highlights movement characteristics that were discarded and made invisible in previous, for instance, ballet aesthetics. 
Uh, and Carol Zygmunt has written about this, uh, among others. If by movement research we understand, and I quote from Vojanovic, experimentation with or by means of performance bodies, then perhaps we need to include research into A, the invisible end still, and B, the moving bodies of spectators. And finally, there is Forsyth's improvisation technology, the use of spatial concepts to create uh, choreography and to discover new ways of moving, extending earlier experiments by Merce Cunningham. White Bouncy Castle is part of a large body of work that is immersive or participatory and engages audiences directly. A trend arguably inspired by the visual arts and heralded by the curator Nicolas Bourriot as expressing a collective desire to create new conviviality, later critiqued by Claire Bishop. Punch Drunk, for instance, with productions such as Sleep No More, which I experienced in New York City, is a well-known company working predominantly in this way. The idea of participation, whether interactive, collaborative or immersive, as is seen as aligned with emancipatory values, as it supports notions of cooperation, equality and community. Technology too, and this is of course the focus of one of our later panels, technology too can have a political dimension, as modern media technologies are often claimed to be used to emancipate spectators, with audiences, producers and creators creating work together, as the Arts Council England remarked in a document. And if we could have the next slide, please. So this is uh, Rosemary and Nick Sunderland. Nick Sunderland is a former colleague of mine from uh, Middlesex University in London. Uh, remote dancing uh, from 2004. And it displays corridors, which is sort of seen a little bit here. It displays corridors with scenes, uh, with screens at their far ends onto which images of solo dancers are projected. The films are only activated, however, when a visitor enters the corridor, triggering a sensor. And the virtual dancer responds to the visitor's movements, effectively performing an interactive duet for them. Work with non-conventional dancing bodies has led to the development of specific uh, strands of dance, such as disability and integrated dance, in the UK, for instance, Kanduko, as well as the increased inclusion of older performers. German choreographer and performance artist Angie Hiesel's X Times People Chair, which is on the next slide, is emancipatory in defining the trends towards youth and cultural performance and in seeking to reclaim public spaces for an older generation. Thoughts about different bodies have also led to an exploration of choreographies that are generated by neurodivergent experiences meaning individuals with brain function that deviate from the typical cognitive state, e.g. people with autism. And finally, Paxton's interest in small everyday gestures, such as smiling, reverberates in recent works. And I'll finish with Sasha Milavich Davis' production, Everything That Rises Must Dance, which I saw two years ago in the public space of Somerset House Square in London. This large scale work features 200 women in a participatory dance piece for women of all backgrounds, ages, shapes, sizes, and abilities, as it was advertised. Aesthetically, it combines many of the characteristics of genre defying work. Performers were asked to collect random everyday gestures from anonymous women on London streets which were then used in rehearsal processes as a basis for the choreography. I mean, hence they really literally use found movement beyond existing vocabulary. So mouvement trouvé, as it were, instead of objet trouvé. In their ordinariness, these gestures were intended to represent a living archive of contemporary female ways of moving, assigning ways to, uh, assigning value to archiving ordinary movement, as you can see here on the screen rather than focusing on highbrow and past artifacts. This is contemporaneous. The work was shown as part of a major political campaign launched by the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, 
entitled Hashtag Behind Every Great City, which aimed at celebrating the role London had played in the women's suffrage campaign, the centenary of women's right to vote, and progress towards gender equality. Everything that rises thus presents what we might genuinely believe to be authentic female movements, indiscriminately drawn from the street and combined to give a female commentary on femininity, which disrupts stereotype portrayals of women's gestures, which often reflect male perspectives. And if there is time, uh, Eva and colleagues, it would be nice if we could watch a brief excerpt from this piece. So it's time. So they've all collected eight, thank, thank you, Raj, they've, they've collected eight gestures, which were then basically put together in a string of sequences by the choreographer. This is the end of my talk, so I, I thank you very much, and I'll pass over to you, um, thank you. Eva. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. It was uh, interesting to to refresh everything what we have learned before and to refresh what we know now. So we'll pass on the next panel. And uh, while we are setting up our uh, Zoom again with uh, the next participants, uh, there will be just one minute uh, small intermedia. Thank you. I would like now to invite Yasin Vasilev as a host of the next panel. Uh, and as well as the participants, Galina Borisova. Krot Jurak, uh, Lili Wittenburg, and uh, Thomas Lehmann, who will be on uh, Zoom. <laughs> hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hear fantastic. So I'm introducing you, Yasin Vasilev. He'll Hi. be the leader, the moderator of this panel, so you can start. Great. Hello, Thomas. Hello, everyone. Uh, so the title of uh, this first panel of the convention is called Approaches to Movement uh, Research as an Artistic uh, Practice. And uh, the basic idea of this panel is to invite artists from different disciplines and countries to discuss their own practices and their own work in relation to movement research. And today we have here uh, Galina Borisova, and she's a 
Bulgarian choreographer with more than 40 works presented in uh, Europe and the US, and she's also uh, currently an active uh, blogger writing about uh, dance, and she's also co-programming a space for contemporary dance called Etude Gallery in Sofia. Uh, then we have Krut uh, Jurak, uh, from, uh, an artist from Estonia, based in Austria, educated both as a choreographer and as a fine artist in the Netherlands, who works interdisciplinary, I think, in both contexts, in visual art and performing arts context, but always uh, in a performative way. Then we have uh, Lili Wittenborg from uh, Germany, who is a visual artist and uh, she works uh, in a very interesting way with uh, materials that are actually immaterial and making visible things that are invisible. And I think we will be having an interesting talk about what is uh, research in, uh, in that practice. And then uh, we have uh, Thomas uh, Lemon, who is a dancer, choreographer, and educator from Germany, based in Berlin, and also educated in the Netherlands in the School for New Dance Development. Oberhausen, not Berlin. I didn't. I didn't get that. Oberhausen, not in Berlin. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and so let's, uh, yeah, let's maybe start. And I, and I want to start with, uh, uh, with Galina. Uh, as, a, as someone who has been uh, classically trained and someone who went through this uh, rigorous training with a lot of discipline and preparing your body to go through these uh, very tough uh, movement routines, I wonder what is the moment and is it uh, a specific moment where you decide to kind of abandon these skills and techniques and to go into experimentation and to research. And also, this is the first part of this question. And the second part, uh, in your um, most recent works, you've been using literature as material and you've been working a lot with different authors like, like Marcel Proust or Virginia Woolf. And always in a very, uh, you're using this material always in a very personal way so that you are owning the material. It seems like this uh, series of productions and performances are a sort of personal journey. And my question is, where is this journey leading you to? And uh, I can see in the productions that dance is opening space to uh, stillness, meditation, to discussion, to audience participation, to... Uh, text to reading, so it's a very interesting uh, change, I think, and a very interesting journey. So what are your intuitions about the continuation of that journey? Yes. Is it okay like this? Yeah. Um, to answer to the first question, uh, it's very strange because I don't know to whom to address <laughs> in which direction to... to um, I, I think uh, since Charles, I was abandoning anything. Uh, uh, I, I was questioning uh, all the time the things. And as I start very early uh, entering the ballet school, but with one year later, because they didn't accept me the first years, because I, I had a scarf on the face. So I, I, I went to do operation and then I, again I went and they accept me and because I think for them was uh, very uncomfortable also when as a small child alone, I was saying uh, uh, probably this year, I don't know if my body is better now, but uh, 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 probably I can enter the school and even I was not sure that I want to become a ballet dancer uh, because I, I knew that I want to dance. Unfortunately, in nine years uh, state choreography school, um, fortunately, let's say first, uh, I, I learned uh, uh, to work very hard, uh, to wake up early in the morning, to be half an hour before the, before the starting time. But unfortunately, uh, my body was only in a, in a, um, in a um, 
in the ballet uh, convention, what uh, position and attitude. And, but I was struggle nine years, uh, and um, I wanted to know more about uh, th theory, but we, it, it, this was a very missing part. Uh, and the teacher, uh, uh, what was available to, uh, to, to read was only the Russian encyclopedia. You know, you know who is who, uh, his name, the birth, um, the, the birth and the, uh, yeah, the death. Uh, year and uh, probably a few title of the of his work and choreographies and fortunately probably one or two pictures so it's you don't you, you have to imagine so my imagination was very um, uh, working all the time all the time and in a moment we um, I finished the school uh, I knew that I'm not going to be a ballet dancer because uh, I felt like an ugly uh, dog. And, uh, uh, my body was not, uh, uh, you know, in the ballet you, you have to, to be almost the same uh, because how will be then this beauty on the stage with Swan Lake that uh, people are different. I mean, in a convention of the classical ballet, they have to be the same. And, uh, and this beauty. And immediately uh, finishing this uh, uh, school where I have to be uh, very slim, uh, in the air, uh, uh, even not to bleed, you know, uh, uh, to be flat, uh, uh, your breast, you have to, yeah, and all this. And I found probably now I go to learn another dance and will be more free. Uh, and so I, I, I went first to Germany. It was uh, only possible uh, before '89 to go to Beluga Schule, and there I studied a few uh, new uh, uh, techniques like Horton, uh, not much in fact, uh, new things. And uh, I, and then I travel. I start to travel a little bit where was possible, uh, and then slowly I was involved very much into modern and contemporary things. So I went to, uh, I was scholar in uh, Duke University. And there it was my shock because first I saw the icon of the modern dance, uh, uh, like Martha Graham, and um, I met even uh, Merce Cunningham life, uh, and I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what is this uh, 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 Postmodern time at just some period, and in Bulgaria uh, the things are coming a little bit uh, slowly and uh, <laughs> a little bit later. Uh, that time when I study and uh, before the era of internet, um, so I uh, I came from fr from uh, from very dancing dancing background, and even my first choreographies was um, very surrealistic. Uh, uh, one mayor from uh, Holland said uh, that I have material for five shows. <laughs> and, uh, and this I remember, and I say probably he is right, it's so much material inside, people don't know how to uh, take it. And uh, yeah, slowly from this panic, ugly dance, uh, because I immediately went to the contrast of ballet to be not comfortable, ugly, and I was working, I have to mention, with uh, actors uh, who, uh, they, they like their body very much, uh, uh, so that's why probably um, um, in my work uh, also one rule for me was never to use dance technique, never. Uh, and I don't know why, but I really hate it after when, I, of course, I studied the, all this release technique uh, and everyone in the 90s was uh, with stone face on the stage and also they are the same, pretending, and also they are very often going down and up, down and up because of uh, the, uh, the falling and uh, recovery and the contract and release and all this from Ruth and Denise and Martha Graham and uh, 
shortly I also was thinking when I was very young to invent probably technique, a few movements, and that's it. Then it's Galina Borisova technique. But I was not so interesting because uh, I was waiting 30 years to discover something and nothing happened except a few original uh, warming up exercises and uh, kind of between vertical and horizontal. Uh, anyway, but the first 10 years I was trying to prove myself to the others. Uh, the next 20 years probably uh, I was waiting people to evaluate my work and uh, 30 years, uh, uh, after 30 years I um, I tried to analyze what I did, and this was the tur turning point from the a lot of movement and choreography and dance to explain to myself what I've, de I've done. Uh, because I, I, uh, my preference is, is first to do something and after analyzing. I am not so, so uh, I'm confused if I have to uh, make uh, uh, if I say what I am going to do, and then I, I will do it. It's kind of an illustration, or it stuck me on. So th that's why I start also writing this blog since um, 20 years, maybe, but the last three years very seriously. Uh, to through the words and to uh, to say what have been done uh, mostly for my work because it's uh, um, um, I, I was uh, it's very confusing to talk in fact about uh, ourselves uh, it's 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 not at all uh, a good position but um, except when you criticize yourself uh, and I'm very much indeed um, critical um, but uh, anyway, from um, uh, uh, ballet to the release technique, and uh, then the turning point was the teaching, because I was as a guest teacher, only a guest teacher, never <laughs> teaching every day, because I think it's, it's a really exhausting uh, job. Um, I, I had to explain uh, to the students why we do this, and so it start this uh, talkative uh, work, and, um, and okay, I'm sorry, and, and then uh, uh, so uh, after these um, periods of time when I was active teacher, I really uh, it helped me a lot. And, but m mostly I was uh, interested in doing choreographies and, and products, <laughs> a kind of commodity, <laughs> not to sell, uh, not thinking through, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, because in fact marketing things and uh, industry, uh, cultural industry, but uh, m mostly to do it for, m for myself and for the group. It was important that you have this experience and because after I'm not wasting my time to manage all the company and to travel and to, uh, although it's very important not to be only in the, in the room, but to have audience, but it's also very important this. And so finally, I really, the last, uh, my solo work because I, uh, it's easy to work with yourself although it's very difficult because you don't explain, uh, you, you don't explain anything to, to anyone. Uh, you try, you are alone, it's very scary. Uh, but um, I wanted to, uh, because um, unfortunately I start reading a lot, of course, when I didn't have so much, uh, didn't spend so much time for, for training and to keep my uh, technique and shape. So I start reading, but really reading a lot from my 30s to 40s. And uh, yes, I was very much impressed by Tolstoy, Chekhov, Marcel Proust, and recently Virginia Woolf. And uh, it's a big challenge to, to use uh, their um, great uh, uh, 
uh, works and yeah, uh, heritage uh, uh, what they uh, left. Uh, and um, slowly by slowly, um, in fact, really very slowly, I start to be very static and um, the first soul was much more close to the uh, uh, photography, Juanita Hildegard Bold and the dance, and then um, uh, uh, what is the diary today because Tolstoy was doing his diary and with six people and some of them are here. We wanted to, exp to explore also what is nowadays to uh, to um, to write a diary because uh, we know the diary of all the world because people are on Facebook and social media so we know how they feel what they did so I said this is not anymore these in in intimate things so but one thing one gesture you uh, discover and it can uh, help and do the whole job because uh, uh, this project with the diary was just people not to be visible with their face. So they were just all the time doing and helping each other, but uh, they had to stay like this. And it's worked a lot, uh, I, I think. And, and the last work, in fact, uh, uh, I'm not participating uh, because uh, uh, how fast uh, life goes uh, from January to uh, December. Um, um, after Virginia Woolf is just the audience is sitting uh, uh, on a nice chair uh, with a nice atmosphere and I tried also to be uh, completely invisible and not to dominate and not to entertain at all. Um, so I'm sorry I was too, too much... Uh, um, it's really answered to my question, I think, of like uh, this gradual change. And then uh, we'll go on in more detail uh, in specific work. Uh, Thomas, can you hear us and can you follow? Yes, I can hear you and I can follow. Great. So next question is uh, towards you. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested uh, uh, when was uh, also because you're an academic, you're teaching, uh, and you're very interested in structures that are then uh, recreated uh, in various different contexts and places. So, so my question is, uh, when you were uh, starting out uh, in late 80s in Amsterdam, uh, was movement research already a thing? Wh when was the first time that you encountered this term? And then how did it shift over the years? What does it mean to you today? And what does it mean in your practice? OK. <laughs> um, actually, I'm not sure if I am an academic, <laughs> because uh, uh, I, I did quite some uh, um, uh, Yes, professor, professorships, and I'm teaching, and so on, and I even published <laughs> something. But I wouldn't call myself really an academic. But um, um, though you see me in front of my um, encyclopedia collection here, which is uh, uh, just by chance, that was no uh, intention. <laughs> mm, uh, yes, indeed, I was studying in Amsterdam. Um, four years in the 80s, four and a half years. And um, the School for New Dance Development there at this time was uh, quite exceptional because we had guest teachers like uh, Steve Paxton, um, uh, from which you could learn firsthand research, what it is to research on something some very fundamental principles um, which are not so bound to an aesthetic form. Though we had all the technical training you could imagine at this time, like um, modern dance elements and uh, classical ballet elements. But all the techniques were taught to us in a way that we could understand them as technical systems 
with which we are able to create our own system and our own understanding of art to be able to create our own practice and that was very fortunate um, because after that school time um, somehow you knew you are not ready yet and the real work starts after university yeah and that was just the school time at this time in Amsterdam I experienced indeed as a uh, incredible possibility to be inspired by all kinds of arts which were very how do you say virulent um, everywhere there was uh, a lot of money for arts and performances and for work um, so you could uh, uh, you could see really the top of the developments in all different disciplines, uh, whether it's in in music or uh, in, um, uh, fine arts uh, or dance and performance, um, or like the top people of the development uh, in the world were invited there. The, though it was a very strong connection to the United States, yeah, there was almost no exchange at that time still uh, with uh, at that time still existing Soviet Union bloc yeah um, not to forget that uh, but uh, and Asian culture was still I think too much considered as something very exotic yeah. um, it's very strange that I cannot hear you so I think <laughs> um, I cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, it's only when you speak something I can hear you. Ah, so okay. it makes it makes me feel very isolated. That's, yeah? that's In between the new world of you technology. Can ask to say something that I don't uh, feel so much alone because the system turns off any sound when you don't speak. It seems like. Um, Okay, uh, that's the situation in Amsterdam and um, um, what education could be. Uh, I think important is to, to keep in mind um, to learn dance, which is not aesthetically um, bound, uh, but to understand the learning as something you are creating. You are not, you don't need to repeat something, but you are able to create. And in my practice now, I'm, um, I'm always focusing on the creative relation of people, but also the creative relation with whatever you are researching, because of course, research is, um, artistic research at least I, I can't talk so much about the scientific research that has very different uh, rules and regulations and parameter to follow but artistic research of course is to be in a creative relation with myself of course with other people with my surrounding with the objects and issues and uh, fascinations the world is giving so in being in creative relation with the world um, that gives probably the most possibilities in the process of understanding something and in the process of creating a piece of work yeah thank you so far I could think like that um, but you see um, Again, now, right now, I'm in the middle of a, um, of, of, a, of, a, of a praxis again, because we, we are very close to uh, the premiere of a new piece. And interesting in that to mention is that um, it works like this, that um, um, I created the first unemployed ballet of Oberhausen. Oberhausen is my hometown and I'm working again here in my hometown, which is a city um, with lots of unemployment, um, 
very, very little, very few possibilities to, for the population to get in contact with art and culture. Um, so I founded the, uh, that company uh, with that ironic name, the first unemployed ballet uh, of Oberhausen. Um, but th that works and uh, we are even able to get some financial support for that because some people understand the irony of it um, and that this really hits the, um, the social cultural needs of the city right now. And it works like this, that basically we are paying uh, people who are unemployed or looking for any reason for work, uh, who are willing to dance with us on stage, of course. And um, this happens in the frame of that project Brauchst du Job? Wir machen Kunst. Do you need a job? We make art. Where basically everybody who has an idea and realize that idea gets paid for this uh, piece of art and for that process. Whoever comes with whatever idea, if it's not uh, 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 totally uh, uh, incorrect or unsocial or is, um, uh, yeah, you know. Um, that works actually very well. And you see, my question is, in which context am I doing my research as an artist or as someone who is doing something? Do I do it in the university? <laughs> do I do it uh, in a theater? Do I do it on the street? Do I do it with my neighbors? Who do I include for which reason? Yeah, Because I think um, the... Um, the political necessities nowadays um, are very much calling for um, acting together in a sense maybe of Hannah Arendt, uh, acting together for something. And I'm, I'm very much believing that of course art should be a very free process because uh, we do it all for freedom of, of humankind of course yeah <laughs> because that's the basic evolution towards that direction but um i think there's also a responsibility for the um for the coherence of society because society seems to be in a process of separating and disconnecting and no responsibility taking for anything or for whatever. And I find that actually a quite dangerous uh, process. So with, um, with the idea of a creative relation, uh, reciprocity actually is, uh, is, is the word for that that um, people are staying with each other in a creative relation with each other to support their creative and artistic abilities. Um, I try at least to, to, um, to spread that uh, and use that, that model in the work we are doing here right now in Oberhausen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this is a good uh, shift to uh, move to Krut uh, Jurek from this social practice. Uh, does it work? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so next question is to Krut uh, Jurek. And um, as I was uh, researching uh, your work, uh, which is so varied, it seems that uh, uh, for each new project, you start uh, from scratch, and uh, you work uh, sometimes with movement, sometimes with stillness, with uh, audience, without the audience, in visual art context, in performing art context, with pets, with your own kids, uh, and blurring basically lines between uh, performance and life also. But uh, it seems to me that a uh, thread going through all the works is some sort of uh, constant inquiry into the conventions of what performance is, what are the roles of the performer and the audience, what is expected, and that it seems that always you are trying to go against this expectation. And I want to ask you what are, uh, is this correct as an assumption, and what are the social and political implications of uh, that? 
Okay, thank you for the question. I, I think you are you're quite correct. Cannot say not even um, even though it's it's quite conventional to question the conventions. Um, I'm also aware of that. Um, but yes, I think that's what I have been doing in the last um, 20 or I don't know maybe more years, and um, I had also to think very hard what was the what is movement research and what do I even have anything to do with it I might have forgotten but it's uh, it's not um, I think I have a lot to do with movement research because it's where I started um, as a teenager I I no originally I was a a little girl and I wanted to do ballet and my parents said no no sorry you can't do it they found some reasons and they they offered me modern dance instead and it was really my second choice but at the time it was still good enough so I I got uh, very much into modern dance and decided to also study then uh, what was called contemporary dance in Holland in a kind of almost the same school as you, maybe Arnhem, Amsterdam, and we also had American teachers. <laughs> um, maybe not Steve Paxton, but the, the people that came after. Um, and there I first uh, started to question, so then this movement research, um, or, as Thomas uh, said, what are the rules and regulations of research? Because it is really not quite so clear uh, when it comes to artistic research. And I, I always felt uncomfortable out about these unwritten conventions, which seemed even more strict because they were unwritten. And I, I started to just say, push the boundaries of if if research is a way for me to make myself comfortable in my work or make myself a good job because as an artist I thought I had the right to make something that I felt also good with what what would work then be and let me just um, um I have a small story like about these rules and regulations. My um, partner, Alex Bailey, who is actually a photographer and his movement background is from football. He was, he joined a ballet, pro contemporary ballet production and they were uh, using authentic movement. Um, and Alex was, um, is a really good example like he does not follow any of these unwritten rules first of all he doesn't know them but also he <laughs> refuses to to let's say pretend to know them and he first of all during the lunch break he would um, oh would go and buy a beer and a falafel and that's just not what a dance production would have for lunch and <laughs> I had to find it very funny, very small details. And when you do authentic movement, you, somehow everything is okay, but standing behind a speaker for the whole time is just not, not okay. Um, so let's say this research into what is and what is not okay, I came across moods as my research and it was just to follow my own mood which is most of the time bad mood and I <laughs> let that take me and I had a very good context for let's say indulging in this bad mood because I was in an art school then um, and I wish to um, see where where my work would be in that context. So this whole 
time that I was writing my thesis, I, I just refused to write the thesis. And, and still something came out of that as a, let's say, this is, um, um, so this, this kind of refusal, even though I'm also quite aware it is um, not at all a new idea, and yet um, I am feeling more authentic than um, trying to, let's say, be enthusiastic. It just does not fit with my wishes. Um, and I've then gradually just found myself actually more comfortable with my work. I mean, it's, it's been a struggle the whole time and I never really enjoyed my work, to be honest, and I could not really state that I was that I wasn't happy. Yet I didn't want another job either. Um, so, just approaching life, and then when we looked at the lecture, there was this pedestrian movement brought on stage, and I just wish now that the pedestrian movement or my own life would just stay my own life, and I'm not I'm not even interested in bringing it to a project or a stage and and I guess they're like on the one hand then I, as I stop working let's say life and the society starts to work on me and I become a what do you call a biopolitical project of my own life um, and I can also shortly maybe bring these examples of auto-domestication, which was, has been very inspiring for myself to feel comfortable being an artist um, amongst, the, amongst all the other artists and not, uh, let's say, to find a, find a way to not be so isolated. Um, uh, and the the way I found <laughs> uh, was to compare ourselves as performers and immaterial workers to uh, household pets, so cats, dogs, and other small or big animals that humans humans uh, keep for their companionship. And I would look at their behavior and existence as artistic activities, artistic research. And then it became quite clear to me how they, the pets, produce value just by being themselves, being authentic, whatever that means, and nobody would um, judge them for being themselves. Or let's say also every pet um, has a value which um, does not have to be everyone's taste, but it can be Yes, so everybody has their place, and um, so there is solidarity, even if sometimes some some animals just do not relate to each other. Um, and auto domestication, okay, led to me and Alex Bailey performing for pets, and as our colleagues, we tried to make something that would where we try to be as good performers as cats and dogs are and hoping for to find their approval and um, so the performances were specifically designed for the pets not for their owners it's specifically for pets while their owners were accompanying their pets and okay. let's say being companions and um, they were necessary and indeed we also found that the performance is a kind of pedagogic experience for their owners to to be in this secondary role um, so it is not a how a did you research this did you have a, a like a pet that you worked with before going to the uh, different um, homes or did you work uh, a little bit before the performances with every uh, pet that you were visiting? What was the process? Well, I, I guess I had a very deep connection to my cat when I was a child and that's where, well, uh, where I could not have come up with this without ever having met a pet. 
closely before. But when we started working, we never had pets, but we went to a neighbor, and then we, we just started off somehow um, very, not really expecting much, or just thinking it was a one-time um, funny kind of experiment, or silly, a very silly idea. And they yet that became one of the most like well um, viral <laughs> projects because yeah. I don't know everybody just has questions: is it really not for us? Is it really not for humans? Um, and yeah, this is funny in itself, I guess. Um, perhaps then I'll just continue with co-domestication and. I have a lot of questions for, for it, but maybe we, we give the words to Lily just as an introduction to research and then we go back to, okay. to talk uh, in detail about a specific project and how you approach research. Okay, I'll just finish off then. Yes. As Lily once told me, um, who is my friend as, um, as well as colleague, uh, that some it was something about merchandising and how you thought that your selling your work was like selling merchandising while actually your work lied somewhere else. And I was, uh, I found this very funny, but also very inspiring. And I would like to also incorporate it to myself and say that like all the work that is visible, everything that is on um, a project on stage uh, can be bought tickets for or documented is merchandising while the real work is is just me <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, so moving to uh, Lily uh, who is uh, coming from the field of visual arts and my uh, as an outsider my impression is that it's a field that is much more free so that the white cube has uh, less conventions than the black box at the same time, it's much more heavy with history because as you see, movement research is like 40 years old, so it's a very, it's an archive that you can grasp, but uh, for painting, for example, it's, it's huge. And uh, so you enter a field of visual arts uh, with an imperative to be new and to research, and also feeling that everything has already been done, so you cannot do anything, but also that you have to do something and everything is possible. And this total freedom, I feel, is very disorientating and you can be totally lost. So my question to you is how do you enter uh, this field? How do you even start to research and how do you deal with this huge history that is preceding uh, your work? Uh, I think once you have knowledge about a field, it always becomes narrow. So for me, entering this field feels like super free and broad and wide and um, less, uh, what was the beginning of the question, was you, you have the feeling like the history of fine arts is heavier than dance, or? Yeah, I feel that it's uh, simultaneously super free, so you can do mm -hmm. whatever you want, but because there are no limits to what you can do, what material mm -hmm. you can use, how you can approach it, you, you can be completely blocked, so mm -hmm. you basically can do anything. In and the also, fine arts? Yeah. Well, you can basically do anything in your whole life, like in whatever you do. We wake up every morning and we have to think about what we do. So, sure, as a fine artist, it's maybe worse because no one tells you at what time you should do it or when you should get up and how the outcome should be. And usually also people like maybe there are too many fine artists, so there's also not much demand or no one is waiting for you. But I think it's all our life is like this, like all the other demands we have or like this make up your mind, what do you want to do today? is like just hidden behind a lot of tasks we have to perform every day, but we could also just do something totally different. And I don't know the art field or the context. I'm not very interested in, in burdening myself with too much history or um, theory or like knowledge because 
sure I can navigate through it and it can inspire me, but it can also really destroy me and destroy my own praxis to like try too much to work in this hierarchy of thoughts and so basically most of the time I try to forget which does not mean that I don't like don't respect what has been done but it's it's so different whether you read or know something about something that has been done or that you if you do it yourself it's very very different so even if I do it as the hundreds person the same experiment or a similar experiment there's always the variation and there's the experience of doing it so I mean, if someone dances ballet, I assume you go into a very strong shape and into a very strong form, but to feel it with your body is very different. <laughs> so, I don't know. Did I answer the question? Yes, or not? I think so. It's yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I'm interested also. Uh, maybe then your research starts uh, not from a particular practice but more from a material and that you get interested in and that you want to explore yeah. and I'm asking this in relation to these super interesting projects that work with light with mm -hmm. radioactive matter and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, with dust so these are yes. always in this dichotomy between visibility invisibility material immaterial mm -hmm. and I think is also related to movement but how do you even approach these uh, materials well, first of all, I really always try to look what I can detect myself, like to gain knowledge about things, not through researching theory or, I mean, I read a lot about physics or stuff, but I also just look around, like, where do I find dust? Where do I find people being affected by things? Like, I grew up next to a nuclear waste place. So sure, I didn't see nuclear rays flying around or something, but I could see like how this uh, matter just psychologically influenced all the people living around this area. So this is something I'm very closely related to. And then I try to think for myself and see for myself. And so I'm also not using very extraordinary space materials but just like house dust or rice powder and then I make my own setup by putting lights for example a light cone and then let the dust move about I mean you all have seen dust move I guess but you can kind of like separate this um, visual experience and put it in an experimental chamber and the very funny thing is then that you have this like light cone and people step into the cone and they look at the dust whirling around and it's like a non-Euclidean space. So you get lost, like you, if you stare, like in a way of meditative staring into this dust, it's like mm, dissolving all construction lines, like you get dizzy and then they step out and then they're like, wow, but now I've breathed in so much dust and then uh, you're like, yeah, but it was just visible in the cone, but it's all over the space. So that was a work I did a few years ago. And it's very strange too. I, I wouldn't do it now because it would be like so flat. But yeah, so I, my research is very um, yeah, I try to try to find out things myself. Like not to not to Patch too far. And, and this itself sounds already very performative, like participatory performative, because you're inviting the yes. audience to enter this space that yes. you have created. And did you think about, did you experiment with your own body, how it feels in this space? Sure. Or was it more uh, the dust that starts from the material and then? It, it sounds it's to me like It's an engagement with meta, yeah. which is sure performative in a way that you physically engage with it. Yeah. Or then with the idea also. I don't know. Okay. Uh, great. And uh, yeah, I, I would like maybe to try to talk a little bit more in detail about how one process of research 
what are the uh, phases that it goes through. So uh, by this I mean how do you enter the research, how do you plan it, how do you execute it, how do you uh, choose the material that you uh, have created, what to put in, what to throw away, how do you document, how do you disseminate, a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, but maybe you can, uh, uh, so this can go through each of you and you can think about a certain project that you want to uh, present in further detail uh, about how you entered into this project. And, uh, does it make sense? And maybe we can go back to, uh, to Krut because she was ready to talk about her project, which uh, uh, I'm very interested in. Uh, one, because I already said it blurs these um, lines between uh, professional and personal, between life and what is on, on stage, whatever. And also because this topic of gender is really a divisive political and social topic right now in a lot of places all over the world. And so I'm interested about the motivation and also what's at stake to put your personal life out there, how much of it is actually out there, and why, why are you doing it and how you're approaching it. A lot of questions. Yes. Um, um, so I'm going to maybe pick the co-domestication as an example. Okay. Um, maybe you suggested that yeah. as well. Yeah. So this project started a couple of months after I had a child. And just two months after, actually, um, I had, I had uh, not planned it that way, if anyone was wondering. <laughs> um, so it just occurred to me at some point that why, since I'm here with a small baby and we spend all the day together every day, and it just started to feel like a collaboration project or a kind of a residency. Um, this guest had arrived, I was going to show him Vienna and like we went to different tourist sites and and the other motivation was that well I just need to make money as an artist and why would I do it then and give the child to some stranger and but be alone in a studio if really what I wanted was to to be with um, my son so that is how it came about and also many other questions then followed such as is this really ethical like does does a small child have a say um, how do I then portray myself? Um, so it, it was very embarrassing on one level and also very educative. And then, uh, I went, then after the first, uh, let's say, research or the, the presentation of our artistic residency, after that I also invited my partner Alex and Albert's father to join and we performed. Uh, in a way like on stage that Albert, the one or two year old, was deciding what we would do. So we were basically improvising um, and following this two year old's um, lead. And our only rule was that Albert was going to have to have a good time. And if not, we would stop the show. And it it was it worked out. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, Thomas, are you there? Because I can't see you. Oh, maybe not. Okay, while we wait for Thomas to reconnect, uh, maybe uh, I can uh, go towards Galina with the same uh, question. <laughs> And it can be one of your, I don't know, you decide, one of your latest projects, but uh, how, does it, how does it go about? I already said that to me it seems that, for example, when you approach a piece of literature, it, it seems that uh, 
it's theatrical, but it's not in any way adaptation. It's not, uh, uh, it's some sort of as if you see that something deeply resonates with you, and then you take it and make it your own. And I'm very interested in this process of, uh, is it some sort of, it's probably some sort of intuitive process where you connect with a text and then you say, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to work about, but how do you build a performance around this obsession or this uh, uh, little thing that triggered your uh, research? Uh, probably, uh, let's take for example uh, the solo. I was working maybe longer uh, and I perform only three times because I needed to do operations so I stopped it. But uh, this is uh, after Marcel Proust and I was um, of course reading two years probably everything uh, in Bulgarian language. Uh, his books or about him and then um, I was uh, one year in studio um, in fact uh, I didn't know and there is a no fixed choreography but it's a very fixed structure it was very easy to decide what the scenography will be because Marcel Brutz spent his whole life in the bed so for, of, of, of course I also enjoyed that um, I um, uh, decided to have uh, uh, 30 pillows in a mattress and inside they have this uh, like uh, for um, uh, th th they can move very easily a small pieces of uh, stereopor um, so the, uh, the, the, the floor where I am mostly crowing uh, uh, is uh, uh, not stable, it's not flat. Uh, the audience was also very easy to decide that they, no question that they should be on the four uh, sides um, to watch because I don't have front. I mean, I, there was, uh, even I was uh, lost uh, uh, on uh, a while doing it because uh, it's a really uh, doesn't matter the direction and it was very um, in fact easy to make decisions but also very difficult to find the, the what my body will do it was uh, very easy also to know that I will do it very slowly and I, I choose uh, to, to have a company by uh, Wag um, um, Wagner, Richard Wagner, because it's also the music is uh, uh, very minimalistic and slowly. So also Bruce likes Wagner very much. And also I like also this that uh, Wagner can write a, a love duet for 40 minutes. So uh, it's also you have time to think, which also it's one of the interesting things I discover in all our, uh, latest work that uh, I, I slow down because I can't think so fast. And if my body move, how I can move without to think? Uh, and this disconnection and why my body dominates to my thoughts. Um, so I was, uh, this project became, uh, uh, um, so I try also to have a little text and uh, very s silly to, uh, um, to try to r write as a Marcel Proust, which is uh, incredible. Uh, 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 um, offensive? Yes. To, to the person you never meet. And, uh, uh, but uh, all these long sentences and um, all these, I want to do this and I will tell you what is love if I knew but, or I will tell you what is friendship but I don't know because uh, who knows. So this project was unfortunately uh, performed um, really three times and I stopped it. Probably I can try to do it with someone um, else if it's interesting in this uh, 
project, but um, um, just to finish, uh, probably I will say that for me is poetry and beauty, even it's a kind of a renaissance uh, understanding of art, uh, because the modern art is kind of a human gesture, and the beauty is probably, we know it since 1750 to 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if the dates uh, matter, um, so the 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 beauty and the poetry and the delic delicate 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 uh, uh, not to be direct, uh, uh, not to be too much symbol symbol uh, symbolic uh, and. Um, yeah, it, it, it became what it is. It's online and everyone can see it. Uh, it has a structure, several parts. Yeah, it has several parts because I needed to change my costume. <laughs> Joke. Yeah, yeah, kind of uh, have some parts, but I think um, if you watch it the whole, it's uh, in YouTube, uh, it's like, uh, one one thing until I go under the matrak and I disappear. Uh, even was very funny how to do the um, lights because I have to count 23.7 minutes the lights go to dark or uh, it was really uh, a mathematic uh, and uh, the technician from the space uh, I uh, was uh, um, very happy that they have to program it and just put the bottom at 27 minutes and then uh, so, so I, I didn't have a lot of changes of course because it was but uh, for me it was like uh, one one part uh. and how did the crawling because how you can walk on, uh, because of course Marcel was uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I had a part on uh, standing and mostly I was struggling to walk and mostly I was uh, sh shouting and uh, trying to, um, um, I work with a very interesting also uh, uh, as a mentor about the music, uh, Rumen um, Balozov. A Bulgarian composer, a very interesting person, and he came uh, uh, just to watch a few times. And he said, "If so, you can't laugh when uh, when someone is dying." And I said, "Yeah, probably is not polite, but uh, why not?" And then I have also Bojan Manchev as a dramaturg, and also he came a few times. <laughs> And he said, uh, and I was explaining to him what I wanted to to make, and he said, well, it's it's okay, it's super. And then he sent me a five minutes video how Marcel Bruce was uh, walking down the stairs, and I said, hmm, interesting. Is this uh, uh, is this what I need? Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, it was very strange with him because I was expecting he to talk more <laughs> and I was very talkative with the dramaturg. <laughs> and, um, and I have in this project uh, to mention the, the, my, my ballet teacher. Uh, recently I work with uh, her as a coach and repetitor and uh, without her it will be really scary in the studio to be alone. So she is very patient to to watch and um, to discuss with someone before to go to become a mat <laughs> with all this. Yeah, it's very difficult to do alone uh, a solo work. Thank you. And Thomas, I see that you're back. Maybe uh, you missed. Uh, we are on the, discussing the different projects in more detail, and I wanted to ask you about your project called A Piece uh, for You, which is a durational unlimited travel project presented in 29 countries in how many? Four continents. 
Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, uh, yeah, how how did uh, this piece uh, come about, and how did you plan, execute, organize, document, disseminate uh, this uh, piece? And also because you uh, uh, you wrote a reflection on it, so you had a fellowship where you were kind of like looking back on your practice. So I'm interested in in that as well. Yeah, um, I uh, I got it all what you were talking about. I just uh, had to go uh, to the bathroom, and I hope you didn't uh, see me getting dressed again or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't we do that if know. I would with you live. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, but I heard what you were discussing. That's uh, quite interesting. Very specific piece for you. Yeah, I could talk a couple of days about that. Um, the main point of that is for everybody to understand what the, let's say, mechanism of that is, that um, I travel through the world, which is at the moment very limited in this COVID-19 situation. Um, and work with groups and ask them to find a person they want to make a present for, a gift, a present, a performative present, and invite that person for the show where they are in a kind of duet situation where one of our group is making this present, this gift for the other person. That person should be uh, normally someone uh, out of that group, maybe a neighbor, maybe the mother, maybe whoever. Um, uh, and they do perform that about five minutes long. So each present is about five minutes long. Um, this developed very well in a very early stage. I was also in that very space where you are now in the Goethe Institute. Um, and we worked uh, with, uh, with a group uh, on that. Um, um, from that moment on, um, it developed very it developed very, very vast and um, it uh, the format was uh, stood actually exactly the same, but it was very interesting what happened, uh, how people were organizing it by 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 themselves. What we found out um, when we were working in Sofia that we do it um, in a party situation in Mila's house. Actually, that was one of the greatest ideas who came up and many other groups decided to do it also in that kind of party situation, even in theaters. Um, so you see, as a spectator, you see maybe 10 groups or maybe 20 of these duets where about five minutes long, one is making a present for the other. Um, this is very often very um, heartbreaking or it's, it becomes very emotional um, because it is usually very, very honest what the people are doing and exchanging there. Um, also the mixture of people who are executing this, professionals and non-professional people, that works very well because usually the non-professional people, they are very, very honest in what they do want to give to who. If you see as an audience this row of 10 or 20 performances, um, usually you would ask yourself, for who would I make a present? or from who would I like to get which present now? So the audience is, is very much participating in that process, though they are not acting by themselves. There's also not a very high step to take because the identification of the audience with the, with the active people in the center of that event 
um, is very, uh, very easy to do because they are unprofessional people, let's say normal people, they are professional people. You always find people you can identify very easily with. So you can think I can do it by myself. Um, that works very well. Um, I had not to finish that whole project and the process um, because I'm still planning to keep going with that. Uh, and the, the, let's say the final result um, is not done in a big documentation or in the film. I have all that material and text collected, um, but it's very difficult to publish that. For one, I think I would maybe end it then, but the idea is actually very endless. Um, and um, it's, it's very difficult to uh, find the resources for that kind of project because it's actually not very cheap and uh, it's very difficult to organize the travel is difficult to organize the places are not easy to organize it is not within the conventional frame of understanding how theaters dance organizations uh, are usually operating in terms of their schedule, when they are doing what. Um, it is also, it, it, there are many misunderstandings in the perception what that project actually is. Um, is it a egoistic uh, travel of Thomas Lehmann who wants to use his motorcycle and come to every spot of the earth uh, because he's getting old now and he wants to live a little bit adventure or something like that. I face that very, very often in that when people oversee um, the point of individual travel from one place to another and gaining experience through that. Maybe the motorcycle itself, this is also a little bit too much a shock for people because they think about rockers or they think about Easy Rider and all these bullshit films, which have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, uh, traveling motorcycle community. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, fortunately, like the Goethe Institute in Sofia, other Goethe Institutes, very independent places, all over the world, uh, private initiatives who understood the, the main point of it, individual travel, gaining experience and exchanging with the road, with the people, with the culture, um, which you are not really able to do when you hop over in, a, in an airplane and you just spend two days in a very different culture and then you leave again then i didn't learn anything um, but in that way i learned incredible much from the people i encountered and on the road let's say um, because i practiced art with the people i met also in at a gas station sometimes um, and to spend time with the people while they work on this theme of what is it to give a performative gift to someone. And I must say, when I, um, when I let's say, came back <laughs> to Germany, um, then I'm, I was not the same Thomas anymore. Yeah. And my view on how art is organized in um, our society here in Germany, or let's say more or less in Western Europe, I'm, I was before critical about it, but <laughs> but uh, now I um, I'm I'm very very critical about it because it it uh, it doesn't function with outside perspective at all, and I became more outside perspective to any uh, processes um, like that. Um, Yes, so far. Thank you. 
uh, have a question for the organizers because we have 10 more minutes. Should we go into questions or can we, do we start on time? Can we extend? We can extend a little bit because we have another section to talk about what Thomas just started talking about, to talk about institutions a little bit. And uh, of course with 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we won't be able to offer like uh, a critical insight into how uh, institutions operate, but uh, maybe just, uh, just a little bit about context and uh, where does movement research take place and uh, where do you, or how as an artist, do you find your own space within this system of grants, festivals, uh, residencies, uh, spaces. So I want to ask Lily, who participated in a several month long fellowship for painters, was it for painters? Yeah, uh, where accidentally uh, for painters, I'm yeah. not a painter. Yeah, well, she's not a painter, obviously, uh, and she was uh, uh, introduced into this program where it was, as I uh, understand from our, your interview, was expected from you to produce an exhibition and to work with uh, brushes, and uh, mm -hmm. so there was a lot of, uh, always these grants and institutions comes with a lot of pressure, I think, and expectation to produce, and then when you are having a practice which, uh, does it really fit uh, within this model? How do you deal? How do you deal with it? What do you do? Um, well, I, I would like to make it a bit broader and not talk about this specific residency because I don't know, are there artists in here? Are there people from institutions? I, I assume yes. Um, I think the difficulty is more interesting to not I can you could use this as an example, but, but maybe I, I can break it down a bit. Uh, I think the difficulty is that it's um, about predicting the future. So you engage with an institution and you have your personal praxis that maybe is serving your well-being as maybe like meditation or as engaging with the world and it's like um, something you do in private which is very difficult, like when I went to art school, the worst thing someone could tell you was, um, I went to art school early 2000s in Germany, very dry thing, um, and the worst thing was someone tell you, uh, oh, your work is therapeutic, and it serves your well-being, that was not something people would want, they would want like more broader questions and theory and heavy stuff, and so, um, yeah, you can go to a residency or to an institution and say, I have this praxis that has its own logic and I can't predict the future. Maybe it will take me there or it will take me to another direction. So what they usually need for funding and everything is this project and, and they also want you to stay kind of who you are. Like they invite you for being an artist in that field and they want you, usually they say like in five months we want an exhibition that has something to do with the identity you put on when you came here. And uh, I find this terribly boring because it's totally destroying what I think art can help us with, which is um, to have chance encounters and to kind of face the unpredictability of our future selves or our identities. So I'm very much against forming this artist's identity, which is usually yeah, either you're a painter or you're a performer or you're a dancer or you're someone who's always um, making nice theory talks. So, but that's, that's all the money thing. Like, funding must be planned ahead. But life can be planned ahead like, like a funding system. And um, we are faced this now. And so I always try to, to kind of break this pattern and um, also fight a lot then with institutions which happened also with this residency because it was a painting thing and I did not paint at all or I did paint but it was not good at all. It was horrible paintings and I also did that kind of on purpose. Also I can paint, I'm just a very bad painter. And, um, 
but, but I, I took it on. on. I was like, okay, you invited me as a painter, so I'm going to paint. <laughs> you may not be happy with, come, with what comes out, but um, I take it as a, like a journey. And um, yeah, it was, it was um, also to show them the unpredictability and also to show them like, okay, even if I fulfill this format, I may be, it's not a good outcome. And it's not, I don't want to have good ideas, I don't want to present myself as someone who struggles for five months to in the end be a good artist in what they demanded. Yeah, and, and this like, yeah, the, this unpredictability of future I, I find the most difficult um, assumption in, in this field of, of art production because I mean, bankers do that, and everybody predicts the future, so maybe artists should try to claim that staying in the process and not trying to pretend to know what they will be in, in five years. But that's totally against all funding logics, all market logics. It's like, you, you almost can survive like this, but... Um, since I'm also in, on the material level very interested in unsuspected events and how things just take me away and develop by themselves. Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of saying like, okay, so in this system I, I don't want to function like this, so I have to maybe have a cooking job or something else. And. Um, and I think now it, it serves artists quite well. I mean, we are, or practitioners in culture, are quite well trained for times like this, with everything being fucked up and difficult to manage, and you don't know where we will be in five months, so uh, that's like my life was always like this, now it's worse, but, but I'm trained. Like, um, and I think this is also something that institutions shouldn't take from us by implying that we have to become this self-managed prodigies that know their identity. Like, I don't know. Is it it's understandable? It's very clear to, to me. me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> and uh, to build on that, I want to continue with Groot, uh, who was very blunt about uh, not wanting another job. So being an artist, being in bad mood, <laughs> and also needing to make money. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, in this precarious situation that artists have been in the last, I don't know how many years or centuries maybe, how do you... Uh, how do you go about it? And also, is uh, your, um, uh, let's say, uh, this jumping between performing arts and visual arts context, is it somehow uh, formed by the situation that you really have to present your work and then you take all the chances you can and you have to be constantly uh, actually changing roles at the same time that from one position you are supposed to, if you want to be more successful on the market to have like a very fixed identity and be the painter who paints uh, the same uh, painting for all of his life, or uh, you have to juggle with, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 different identities? Um, yes, yeah, so a lot of my activities are based on practicality, and I must say like now I really realize that every time I did not get what I maybe wished for, it was actually good, or like the second choices are, have been, what really, mm, I don't really believe in progress, but the second choices is something that I could call progress. And so actually the misfortunes have really helped me and also my material insecurity, like let's say having to reach out to other ways of uh, making money really, has have made life and my work even more interesting for me. And I'm also quite interested in how these institutions that you brought up are also actually very porous and not as clear when you look at it because they often consist of our friends and 
than our friends for our institutions, the family we live in, or I live in at least, is also an institution. And these come with desires which are often uh, something that we do not want to be um, fulfilled. Uh, okay. okay, and then I go to Galina uh, with uh, uh, so two questions uh, related to gr grants institutions. One is I have a feeling that uh, and this push to research and to be new and exciting is so so strong that if you just want to dance beautifully, as you said earlier, if you just want to dance, dance, it's impossible to do it, and so you are pushed to to do research. And what, what is your position about that? And also, I want to ask you to tell me a little bit about the space you are running in Sofia, and how do you go about this as program or as curator? How do you give this space to artists? How do you use it? And uh, what is its significance? Uh, of course, it's very difficult to make a project with uh, more than five, even with five people uh, on freelance uh, freelancers, because uh, you have to do this doodle uh, uh, tablets uh, uh, to find out probably to probably to work during the night, uh, which could be also fun, but uh, uh, and also we have less dance because of course we don't we have a lack of uh, spaces uh, and stages uh, with the good equipment uh, to do it. Uh, that's why I was lucky that friend of mine, Annie Collier, who lives in America, and uh, uh, she also has a foundation at Ute and uh, probably more than 20 years, but our space is since five years. And he bought it and gave it to us. So our space is very small, 75 square meter, with basement, and uh, it's uh, we do exhibition, a lecture, a anything, a festival, a performances uh, inside, uh, uh, connected not only with dance but with all the arts. Uh, um, so I'm lucky that uh, I have this small space, and also I can give it to friends and colleagues to help them. Uh, to use it for free, and uh, we are completely independent. Uh, of course, I struggle to um, apply uh, to do all this application, and uh, I know that uh, uh, I want it uh, since coronavirus uh, to be a little bit more uh, in a dialogue position with the institution, because I can imagine 4,000 people applying, uh, and there are six. Uh, six people and they have to deal with all this application and uh, even uh, nowadays uh, no one wants to be in the committee and no one wants to be responsible and everything is uh, strange so we have to uh, sometimes uh, sacrifice our things and help them or go into the uh, who 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 wants from the artist to go in administrative uh, work, no ones. Um, uh, so we have to be very patient. I don't believe anymore in, uh, because I don't have time, I'm uh, uh, in the middle of my life. Uh, so I uh, go uh, in uh, uh, all this uh, organization and um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, association or um, um, uh, syndicate, syndicate. syndicates. Uh, 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 it's uh, it's again uh, gathering a lot of people to make a decision and to do all these points and questions. So I, I found direct way you go straight. It's my advice to you. You you take your telephone. You uh, you talk to someone. You explain him what is the problem. And I, I'm sure that he will think about this and probably go to. He goes to one person more, involve him and say, look, we have to do this and this and this. Because the, we, we are the artists and it's a luxury position that we do what we like. And uh, of course we sacrifice uh, and fuck up uh, a lot of uh, things, uh, real things we have in life. 
but we don't possess uh, life. We we have to um, um, to share what we have. In fact, anyway, we are going to die uh, sooner or later. And and I, I will finish with this: that uh, we all are equal uh, by our social rights, but I'm not sure that we are equal in our talents. Thank you. And uh, so last question to Thomas uh, uh, about institutions. Uh, it was very interesting what you said about your work with the uh, unemployed, how was it, the collective, unemployed uh, dance Play. group? Yes, in your uh, hometown. And uh, so maybe this uh, direction towards some sort of, let's say, socially engaged practice is one uh, possible route, and then another one is uh, uh, a growing tendency of artistic research becoming a academic and becoming part of this uh, production of knowledge, which by itself is problematic. What you, or, you already said that uh, artistic research does not function as scientific research, but it seems to me that within universities and institutions it's forced to to function in ways that are not really uh, so relevant to art practice. So yes, I want to ask how do you navigate this landscape and how do you uh, find ways to work? Two chapters are opened uh, with that. The first is... Um, I'm, I'm doing this uh, work of paid work, uh, paid artistic work for um, whoever comes. Um, now a couple of years here, and I combine it with um, the Kunsthaus, the Art House Oberhausen, which I uh, created, and this is running since a year now. And that's a very independent institution. Basically, I'm running it more, so more or less by myself uh, with, with the aid of sometimes a couple of other people uh, where artists or whoever wants to be in artistic practice or exchange can use rooms there. We also have now a little residency program, which uh, for now is... Uh, restricted to um, North Rhine-Westphalia, um, not all Germany even, and it's not yet an international program, but we can give a little bit of money and space and studio to artists of all genres there. Uh, but that's working very, very independent, and it only works because we have one good guy in the city uh, house, the city government, who is the, um, who is the, uh, I don't know the English word, I'm sorry, who is um, um, the boss of the money of the city, and at the same time he is the boss of culture of the city. And I really would under, underline very much what you, Galina, said, go to the person and um, Talk to them. If you find someone who is who has an ear and is talking to you, go there one time, three times, five times, until they understand what you are doing. If you are really willing to do something, at least now in Germany, the situation is like this: that the government, on which level ever, the of, of the government of Germany or the county or the city, they are looking actually very actively for projects which work in the uh, interface of society and culture and art and politics because they realize that society is um, having a very difficult process right now. Fortunately, the German government, they have money, they even increase their budget the next year. That's incredible. Even Corona, even the internet, they promised there will be next year more money for culture because I think also they see that many people do a very, very good job in that field. And this really works. But it has another side of it. Um, um, of course, 
it is possible that this artistic activity in that interface, society art, is instrumentalized for the stabilization of the political needs. Um, this is something to consider, and it's uh, to consider what that process, when you are talking with people from the government about the themes and about how to work with which people, what it does to your practice of art. Yeah. That is something I think everybody has to find out by themselves, how they do that. And um, I have not yet really a solution of it, but no, actually I have a solution for myself found, which is to keep in mind that this should be artistic processes which are applied in that work. And my experience is that actually all the people who are coming, for example, to this art house in Oberhausen or who are joining these projects um, with a, do you need a job, make art, um, and the audience who sees it, that they understand very, very well the artistic side of it. They don't actually need so much uh, the explanation of it, why it is now politically important, why it is so important for society now. Uh, how does art work, this strange thing of art? Um, do they understand what I'm doing or not? No, people do understand. Everybody understands art immediately, actually. It's, may it's maybe more the um, the matter if the audience, if people are trained to talk about art and to talk about the incredible possibilities which arts offer. Most of the people are not uh, used to talk in that way about it, but they do understand and they can participate. That's no question. But that actually leads, now I understand why you asked the second question. Um, if we keep in mind that we are using artistic processes and artistic criteria in that work, also, in, also when we touch political issues, when we touch social issues, when we touch whatever issues, we do apply artistic processes and we create our own artistic criteria. Yeah? Like, for example, Pröd does uh, fantastically uh, when she works with animals. It's, it's the artistic um, uh, criteria are applied to that and no other criteria. These are no criteria which can be articulated through a scientific research because they are beyond that they can be proven, but this is actually what people are always asking for, something they don't understand yet and bring us in connection with what do I don't, what don't I understand yet? And this is actually the base of uh, all our lives. We don't understand yet, but we have to continue. And this is why this artistic work should go on, of course. Great, thank you very much. I think this is a great ending of the discussion and because we're pressed by time, uh, we have to wrap it up. Thank you everyone for participating and for being so open and honest about your practice. Yes. Uh, I just want to say some few words. First of all, because Alexandra Kolb is still with us online. Uh, for, uh, thank you, Alexandra, for your introductionary uh, talk. I think that you addressed a lot of questions that are developed now. Unfortunately, we don't have time uh, for a discussion. We will continue it uh, in an informal way and circle. Thank you to all online and also here uh, uh, physically present. Um, we continue at 2.30 Bulgarian time, 1.30 Central European time. So with a, a panel which tries to relate movement research to work with dance archives, what is movement in cultural memory, etc. So see you then. Bye. Online and we continue. <laughs> Thank you.
Peace. 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 Peace.